Shabbos daf Yud Gimel contains one Mishnah, about three quarters of the way through the daf. Up till then, the daf discusses the last phrase in the previous Mishnah, which concerned itself with a Zav and a Zava not eating together in order to prevent them from coming to an Avera, along the list of things which Chazal created to avoid putting us in situations where an Avera might happen by mistake. Now the Gemara will ask about a Nida, whether she's allowed to sleep in a bed together with her husband. And the Gemara will bring four proofs on that subject, which will take us into some other situations in which Chazal created rules to avoid a Shraman Avera, such as cheese and meat on the table together. And then we will get into a little bit of the Harchakos of Nida, and the famous story of Elio Hanavi, and the wife of the Talmud Chacha. So let's see the Gemara over here. The Gemara quotes the Mishnah, which says that a Zav and a Zava, who are two types of Toma, a man and a woman, who both have Tomas Ziva. The Mishnah said they're not allowed to eat together at the same table, because it may bring them to an Avera. If they're eating together, it may lead to closeness. The Gemara is uh, simply referring to a husband and a wife. The Gemara says, a bracer of Shimon ben Elizabeth said, see how great the halachas of Tomei and Tahara are. We taught this halacha in a situation where we have a Zav and a Zav that are both Tomei. We didn't discuss a situation where one of them, where the husband, for example, let's say, was Tahar and the wife was Tomei, and say that in that case they shouldn't eat it together because it may bring them to an Avera of being together, because in a case like that, there was no need to discuss it. Everybody was so careful with their Tomei and Tahara, they did not eat any food together with somebody who was Tomei, even regular food because they were trying to avoid their food becoming tamay to keep the halachos of tahara even where it does not necessarily have to be applied. Now, the Baisa also says that two zavim, one is a tamal chacham, one is an amar, should also not eat together, because that might also cause problems. And the Gemara says, obviously, we're not talking about the same avera as before, where it's a man and a woman, so what is the problem here? So here is the machok, is Abaya and Rava. Abaya says the concern is that the amaret may feed or give the Tam Chacham to eat food which is not Maisered. And we know that Amaratim often did not keep the Halachas of Maiser correctly. Rav says, no, the vast majority of Amaratim do keep the Halachas of Maiser. That's not a concern. The concern is that if they eat together when they're both Zavim, they may eat together when the uh, Tam Chacham is Tahar, and then the uh, Amarats, who would be suspected of Tama, because they did not keep the Halachas of Tama correctly, might feed him some of his food, and he'll end up feeding him tummy food. Now, once we're on the subject of Harchokos Nida, avoiding um, interactions with a Nida, the Gemara will ask a child here. So let's have a brief introduction to the rules of Harchokos Nida. We know that the Tara forbids intimate relations with certain women. Primarily, it refers to one's relatives, such as a sister or a mother or something like that. And there is one that applies to his own wife, which is Nida, while she's in a menstrual state, or depending on the type of menstruation, could be even c- continuing for a few days afterwards until she goes to the mikvah. That at these times she's a Nida or possibly a Zava, and uh, the same rules of forbidden relationships apply to her. Now the Torah, when it lists these isurim, these uh, forbidden relations, it says lo sikrevu legalis It says don't even come close. As we will see later in the Gemara, there's a machlokus between the. Tanayim, what does Leisikrevu mean? Does it mean not to do an actual action of intimacy, or does it mean not to do something which could bring one to a state of doing such an action? So the Gemara over here has the question, is a man and his wife, when she's in a need to state, are they allowed to sleep together in a bed? Um, the question being, when they're both fully dressed, are they allowed to sleep together in the same bed, or is that a problem? Or are we afraid that it may lead to a forbidden intimate activity? So, the Gemara's uh, reasoning that it's possible to permit this has two logical reasons why this should be okay. Number one is that there are two people here. Either one of them would be enough to remind the pair that this isn't something that they are not allowed to do. So you have two p- people here. That's factor number one. Factor number two is that they are doing a departure from normal sleeping activity because they are both fully dressed. Since it's a departure, since it's a departure, that will serve to remind them that they're in a state of Easter and they shouldn't do anything further. So the Gemara's question is, is it permitted for them to sleep together in a bed fully 
dressed. Now, the Gemara will attempt to resolve this question with a series of four proofs. Ultimately, we'll have to turn back to our Mishnah, which we just read about the Zav and the Zava. But before that, the Gemara will turn to the Halachos of meat and uh, cheese appearing together on the same table and the possible concern which may come up that one may come to eat the two of them together. So we will discuss three cases. The first is the case of one person who's eating by himself, but he's got chicken and cheese. Now, chicken and cheese are not also to eat together midaris, it's in a Sidrabanon. And you have one person here who has the two appearing on the table. Beishamai says that that's permitted because it's only because even if he were to eat the two of them together, it would only be an iser. They're abundant, so he's allowed to have them on the table together, of course, but not to eat them together. And Beishilo says, no, that's also forbidden. So in this case, one person with cheese and uh, chicken, that's forbidden. Then you have the case of two people that are eating together. One is eating meat and one is eating cheese. Are they, are they allowed to be on the table together if they do not know each other? So the Gemara says that's permitted. However, if you have two people eating together, one cheese and one meat, and they do know each other, and therefore they, it's more likely that they will come to share their food with each other, that is clearly forbidden. So the question is, our case of the husband and wife sleeping together in a bed, which of these three cases does it compare to? Though, so the Gemara will try them all. The Gemara first says, let's compare it to the case of chicken. The Gemara says that's not comparable. Even though in that case, Beis Hillel says that it's Aser, this case might still be Mutter. Why? Because in that case, you only have one person, so you don't have two people. We said that two people is more of a way to remember that a certain activity here is forbidden. Here you have two people, the husband and the wife, and therefore they're more likely to remember, and it could be that it's still Mutter. The Gemara says, according to one version, the Gemara brings this as a separate proof. According to another, this is to support its answer. The Gemara says that if you have the case of two people that are eating meat, and they don't know each other, so that is permitted. So you see clearly that when you have two people, we're not worried that they will come to a further Avera. So Gemara says, but that's not a good case to compare it to because the husband and the wife know each other. Those two people don't know each other. It's, we should compare it to the third case where you have two people eating together. One's eating meat and one is eating cheese and they both know each other and there it's clearly forbidden. So in our case, where you have the husband and the wife who obviously know each other, should also be forbidden. Mara says, no, but we have, a, a, we have an additional reason here, and that is that the husband and the wife have a shinui. They have a departure from their normal activity, which is that they are both fully dressed, which is not how things usually were. And therefore, they will remember that they cannot progress to a further activity, which would be us. Now, actually, the halacha is that if you have two people that are eating together, one is eating meat and one is eating cheese, and they know each other, if they do have a shinoi, also they have a departure from the normal way of eating, such as one has a mat and one doesn't, that is also an indication, that is also a reminder that they will not, that will keep them from coming to doing an iser. Okay, now the Gemara has another proof here, and that is our Mishnah, where it says a zav cannot to eat together with a zav, because a zav cannot eat together with a zav, because it may come to an avera. So obviously, in our case, if they can't, if we, if they can't eat together, certainly they couldn't sleep together in a bed. Versus also, it's different here because we have a shinoi. They're both fully dressed. It's a departure from their normal activity, so it's not a proof. So the Gemara now answers with a pasuk and a limud. The pasuk in the Sefer Cheskel describing uh, the performance of a tzaddik says, "El haharam le'achal." He did not eat to the mountains, which means he did not rely on the Zchusim of Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. Einav Nasa el Gilule Beis Yisrael, he did not look towards the Evo Dezara of Yisrael, as Eishas Reyel Etime, he did not contaminate his wife's, his friend's wife, and he did not draw close, but El Isha Nida Lo Yikrav, he did not come close to a Nida. So the Gemara says we have here a link, a hekesh between Eishas Reyel, somebody else's wife, and Isha Nida, his own wife, while she is a Nida. The verses we could learn from that, that the halachos are similar. Just, you should treat your own wife during the status of Nida, as far as the halachos of avoiding coming towards intimate situations, you should treat it the same as somebody else's wife. And just like, obviously, it would be forbidden for somebody to sleep in bed together with somebody else's wife, no matter how fully dressed they are, because it would be a yichud. So the same should apply to one's own wife. They could not sleep together, even fully dressed, in the same bed. Well, this opinion obviously holds that when the Torah says, like, Sikaru, do not draw close, it means don't even do anything which could come to an Iser of being together with one of the Arias, one of the forbidden relationships. However, the Mer notes that Rav Padas disagrees, and he says, no, like, Sikaru, like, doesn't mean don't do anything close, it means just don't actually do an intimate action. That's what it means when it says, like, Sikaru, like, Now, the says that Ula had somewhat contradictory opinions here. Ula used to say that anything which comes close, anything which is 
somewhat intimate is forbidden, like it says, Lech Lech Amri Nazira, Schar Schar Le Carmel Sikrap. You have to tell a Nazir to not even go near a vineyard, that he shouldn't come to an Isser. Yet yeah, the Gemara notes that when Ula came home from Yeshiva, after a while, he would kiss his sisters. According to one version, he would kiss them on the chest, and according to another version, on their hands. Now the Gemara quotes a famous story. About the Talmud Chacham, his wife. The Gemara says that Elio Anavi said, Tana de Bey Elio. It was a story with a certain Talmud who learned a lot and he knew a lot of Gemara and a lot of Torah. And he was Shimish Tamil Chacham, in which Rashi says he learned the meanings of the contradictions between Mishnayas, meaning he learned Gemara. And he knew a lot of things. And yet, he died when he was about half the age that a full lifespan should be. So the Gemara says that his wife was upset about it, and she took his tefillin, and she went from shul to shul, from base medrash to base medrash, and she said to everybody, listen, and the Torah, it says, Ki yomecha. The Torah is the length of your life and your days. So that my husband, who learned so much, and he knew so much, and he learned Talmud Chachamim, he learned from Talmud Chachamim, he knew Gemara, Mishnah, Psukim, how come he died in half his lifespan? So nobody was able to answer her. So in one time, Elio says, I stayed at her home. And she told me this whole thing, this whole story. And I said to her, my daughter, when you were in Nida, what was his uh, comportment? How did he behave? So she said, Chas he didn't touch me with even his little finger. So then he said, okay, so now when you were in your days of cleanliness, meaning you still had Tomas Nida, you hadn't been to the mikveh yet, but were no longer menstruating, and therefore you had what's, uh, what's called the white days, the clean days when she wore white. So what did you do then? What was his um, behavior then? So she said, what do you mean? We did everything right. He ate together with me, he drank together with me, he slept with me together in the bed without clothing, and he never even dreamed of doing anything forbidden, doing anything further. So he said to her, he said, Baruch HaMokam Shehogai, blessed is Hashem who killed him, because he did not keep the Torah. The Torah says, you may not draw close to any though. You're not just, you're not allowed to do it forbidden, you're not allowed to do anything close. And he didn't do what he was supposed to. Now the Gemara over here is wondering how could a Talmud Chacham make these mistakes? Gemara says that Rav Dimi said that it was a very large bed that they had, and they slept together in the bed, but they were far from each other, not in contact with each other, and he thought that that was permitted. And the other thing that Rav Yitzchak Bar Yosef said was that although they weren't dressed, they were not in contact with each other because they had a sheet of some sort that was between them. Now this takes us to the next Mishnah. The Mishnah is a sort of an addendum to the Mishnah before, which had a list of halachos which which Chazal made to keep us away from Averis. And the Mishnah says here as follows, that these halachos were said in the attic of Hanania when Chizkiya ben Goroin, when the Tamid Chachamim went to visit him. And uh, they counted there at the time the Tamidim of Beishamai and those of Beishil and decided that Beishamai was more and they voted on 18 halachos and at that time they issued 18 gzeris, 18 rulings. So the Gemara first asks this Mishnah that discusses these 18 things and this list and that these halachos are from them. What's it referring to? It's referring to the previous Mishnah or is it referring to the Mishnah as it follows? And the question is, what is the phraseology of here? It says, ve'il min halachos and these are the halachos that were said on that day, meaning it's referring to those that came before, or is the proper text, Elu men halachos, no, and. These are the halachos, then it's referring to ones that follow. So Gabor says, we have a brisa, which is pretty clear, it says, Ein pulun lor haner, you're not allowed to pick off lice by the light of a candle, you're not allowed to read by the light of a candle, and these are the halachos that were said in the attic of Hanani ben Chizka ben Goran, so you see clearly that this Mishnah is talking about the halachas which come before it. Okay. Now the Gemara will fill us in a little bit on Hanani ben Chizkiah and what, who he was and what happened over here. So the Gemara says there was a book called Megillah's Tainus, which was, was a scroll which listed the days of the year which we are not allowed to fast. Now, um, fasting was a much more common thing back then when there was rain issues, because whenever there wasn't enough rain, they would call a fast. All these halachos are spelled out in Masech the Tainus. But Megillah's Tainus had a list of the days in which you were not allowed to fast. You couldn't make a fast day because it was some kind of a miniature yantif because of some great miracle that happened then. So Yomar says, who wrote that Megillah? Yomar says, that was Hanani ben Chizkia. And his uh, coterie, what was special about them that they wrote this Megillah? Because they had a special love for troubling experiences because of the yantif that followed when the miraculous salvation occurred. So therefore they wrote this list of 
the days when miracles happen and we shouldn't make a fast day. So Moses Rav Shimon Megamil says we also love those days. But we realize that you can't make a yontif out of every single trouble that ever happened to the Kaisal because there's no end to the list. There's no end to the list. We would never have any fast days at all if we stuck to the list. Now the Gemara has two expressions here. One is that a fool does not notice when he's insulted. Or a similar expression is that the dead don't notice when you stab them. You know, is that true? The dead don't notice when you stab them? But Rabbi Yitzchak said that when the maggots eat the flesh of the dead, it stings as if a needle is stuck into the flesh of a living person. Like it says, Ach basari alav yichav. So the Gemara says, no. Talking about dead flesh on a living person. Should somebody have that, and you were to stick a knife into it, he wouldn't feel it. Now, <coughs> the Gemara says, who is this Hananiah ben Chizkiah, and what was he doing in the attic? So the Gemara says that, uh, Rav says, they, the Chachamim wanted to hide and depose, get rid of Sefer Yecheskel, the, the Sefer of Yecheskel Hanavi, because there's a lot of things in there, lists of Karbonis and Halachos of Tama, which contradict the Halacha that's explicitly said in the Torah. So they wanted to get rid of the Sefer. So Hanania ben Chizkiah took it, and he took 300 barrels of oil, and he went up to the attic, and he sat, and he learned until he was able to resolve all the contradictions and explain them. Now, the 300 barrels of oil were for light and for food. Okay, now, the Mishnah said that there was a list of 18 things that were created on that day. The Gemara now begins discussing the list of the 18. So, what are the 18? So, the Gemara says we have a Mishnah which says as follows. There are certain things which puzzle a person from eating truma. That means that it creates a level of tumma on a person, that he's not allowed to eat truma. That uh, is not a main tumma that the person himself contracted, but that he got from somewhere else. And they are as follows. First of all, somebody who eats a rishon tumma. Midaraisa, of food, is not metame a person, but midarbanon, it is, and he can eat truma. The second is somebody who eats a sheni. And somebody who drinks liquid, which is a shani, becomes tummy and he can't eat shuma. Now, somebody who went to the mikvah and became tahar, and then he put his head and the majority of his body into mayam shuva, that's drawn water, that's puzzle water. So we say that his he gets tumma on him again, because we don't want people to be confused and assume that it was the puzzle water, the mayam shuva, the drawn water, which gave him the tumma and not the mikvah that he went to before. Now, any tahar, a person who has Rosh Hashanah, who has the, his head and the majority of his body covered with three lugin of drawn water, again, that is a psal for a mikvah, and he therefore becomes tummy for the same reason. Next, a sefer, a sefer kodesh, like a Torah or something like that, that makes a person tummy if he touches it. The reason was because we do not want people to have it together with their food so that it wouldn't mess up the safe air because of the food. Next, um, hands. Regular unwashed hands have the status of a shani with tumma. If you are touched by them, you become tummy, you can't eat chuma. Tfulyayim is somebody who went to the mikvah for tumma and he did not have sunset yet, so his tumma, his tahara is not completed. And food or kalim that are touched by liquids that are tame, that is exerted or abundant, that the liquids have super tumma, transferring powers like we saw at the end of Masachta Brachis.